Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the Colonel Talk. You never know whether it will be uh, in person or remote. This time it's remote. Um, we've got... We've got Ben Hutchins pre presenting uh, with a pre-recorded video and he will be present via Jitsi during the Q&A session. If you want to um, pose, <laughs> excuse me, pose questions via ILC, please direct them to me on the ILC channel, which is hash debconf hyphen anamudi, A-N-A-M-U-D-I. And with that, I will hit play. There we go. Should be going. Hitting play doesn't actually result in the video playing. One moment, please. We'll try again. In what's now become uh, uh, an annual tradition, I'm going to be talking about some of the things that have changed in the past year or so in the Linux kernel. Uh, and what work still has to be done in Debian to fully support or take advantage of those features. So a little about myself, uh, I have been working on uh, the Linux kernel and kernel related code, uh, both in Debian and in my paid employment for now about, for about 15 years uh, on the Debian kernel team and also the LTS team. And I do various work uh, in kernel packaging and backporting fixes and uh, sometimes features. I used to maintain uh, the, uh, the long-term stable branches of the Linux kernel or needed by Debian, and I might have to start doing that again in the future. We'll see. As you may know, uh, the Linux kernel releases early and often. There are feature releases every nine to ten weeks, which makes for about five or six releases a year. And then there are stable updates for uh, some uh, applying fixes to all the versions uh, every week or so. Some features uh, take more than one release to uh, become really ready for use or complete. Uh, and some new features need changes elsewhere in the system to be useful. Sometimes there'll be a new user space tool to configure a new facility. Sometimes um, it needs an extension or a new version of an existing tool. Uh, sometimes there's an API that's meant to be used by multiple uh, applications or libraries. Uh, and there are sometimes there are changes where we need to uh, update packaging to support those. This year I'm going to be talking about new features that appeared in versions uh, 5.19 to 6.5 inclusive. So I'm going to quickly recap some of the features I've talked about in previous years and um, what's what's happened with those. Uh, the RISC-V architecture is uh, no longer quite as new an architecture uh, as it was when I first talked about it. Uh, and it might even be a release architecture for the next version of Debian. And since last year, uh, it's gained support for ACPI. That's the firmware interface that, uh, well, a set of firmware interfaces that's supported on uh, PCs and on some computers with, with other uh, 
uh, other types of CPU uh, now into the risk five, and that's part of what allows a, a general distribution like Debian to run on uh, PCs and other computers without needing specific support for those uh, models. Uh, and is often the case on um, has often been the case on R and MIPS. So uh, RISC-V supports that. It supports hibernation also in the suspended disk. Uh, and it supports building the kernel image as a uh, position independent executable, which is about to be easy, easily relocatable, uh, which uh, can be good for security. Uh, the RISC-V uh, architecture has been extended in some interesting ways. Uh, the vector set Extension is a SIMD um, uh, facility comparable to AVX on x86 processors or Neon uh, or on ARM. Uh, unlike those, however, it's designed to, be, to support variable length vectors, so the, the same, same instructions will be usable on. Uh, uh, or low-end and high-end CPU designs that have uh, varying widths of SIMD hardware. Uh, and the same program can also take advantage of future CPUs that uh, can process even more effective elements at the same time. There's another extension that supports intermediate TLB entries. Uh, TLB is a cache that's present on um, any CPU that supports virtual memory, and that's a cache of virtual to physical mappings. The TLB has a limited size, uh, so the more memory you can uh, you can map um, with a single entry, uh, the better for um, more likely you are, you are to get cache hits. Uh, so the base page size on a RISC 564 uh, is normally going to be four kilobytes. But you can mark those four kilobyte white pages as being contiguous, uh, and thus, um, on some CPUs, uh, take advantage of a 64 kilobyte TLB entries. Uh, so a larger range of memory is mapped with a single entry. Now on to IO U ring, which is the, the new, not so new now. Uh, High performance uh, asynchronous IO facility for Linux. Uh, this has gained a few more features since last year. Uh, you can uh, submit a multi shot accept operation, uh, which can accept multiple uh, network connections rather than just one. You can use IO hearing for operations on extend, five extended attributes or X actors. You can do zero copy network transmission. The send and send message uh, system calls are defined uh, such that they send whatever was in the user buffer at the time you called. Uh, so in case uh, the user program modifies that buffer between uh, making the call and the data actually going out onto the network, the kernel has to copy that data into a kernel buffer before returning. If, uh, if that's not a problem for your application, then you can use a, an alternative zero copy transmit API. Uh, and then the, the kernel will just uh, lock your buffers in memory uh, and the network hardware can uh, transmit directly from your user laptop. On some file systems, it's possible to issue multiple direct IO operations in parallel. Uh, on other file systems, those operations will still be serialized. Uh, IO viewing supports timers for um, timing out our operations. This can now be configured as multi shot so that they will, uh, they will fire repeatedly at intervals. Uh, it's also possible to allocate the command and completion rings via uring in user space memory now. Well, that allows you to, 
to allocate larger rings, which wasn't possible previously uh, when using kernel memory. Uh, and finally, uh, ID map mounts. Uh, these are a feature of the uh, um, file system core uh, that allows a single file system to be exposed in um, multiple user namespaces and to have owner user ID and group IDs look right in each of those uh, user namespaces. And that's quite useful for uh, container systems. Um, without this, um, you either have to not use user namespaces, which are rather useful uh, um, containing feature, uh, or any um, any volume that's used in multiple con containers in different user namespaces uh, has to be copied when those uh, user namespaces when those containers are started. Uh, so ID map mounts are mostly implemented in the file system core, but also need some work in individual file system drivers. Uh, that was done for some of the block backed file systems already since last year. It's now also supported by OverlayFS, which is rather important for containers, uh, in SquashFS and in TempFS. Uh, and uh, ID mapping can now be used by CRUM, LXC, and uh, some other container software. It can be used by the good old mount command. Uh, there's an extended option for that. And systemd can use that presumably when uh, uh, enabling user namespaces for a per service. So now moving on to completely new features. Uh, you could have user space block drivers. There's a, a ublock, ublk uh, driver in the kernel. Uh, and that's its front end, which delegates all block operations to a back end driver in user space. The back end drivers can use an existing library in daemon called ublock serve, uh, but that's not yet packaged for, for Debian. I've opened a, opened a request for package for that. Now a feature that's supposed to improve the behavior of the memory manager and thus hopefully performance. It's multi-generational LIU. When system RAM is nearly full, the memory manager needs to decide which pages of virtual memory should be kept in RAM and which should be reclaimed uh, by flushing those out to swap or to uh, a file. In theory, what it should always do is reclaim the least recent used pages. Uh, in practice, it's generally not possible to track exactly when pages are accessed, uh, anything that's uh, memory mapped into a process. Uh, it can be written at any time, and uh, there's no way to know exactly when that is. So it's necessary to do a periodic scan and apply some heuristics. Uh, also, sometimes in practice, the least recent recently used pages will actually be needed again quite soon. And the most recently used pages won't. Uh, so this goes wrong and you can have thrashing uh, where pages are repeatedly moved in and out of the memory. So multi-generational LRU or MGLRU replaces the, uh, the previously used algorithms uh, for determining what's least recently used. Uh, the old algorithms, you keep active and inactive lists, uh, which uh, roughly divide the more recent and less recently used pages. MGLIU divides into four generations. Uh, the old algorithm, algorithms iterate over physical page frames and then uh, use a reverse mapping from the back to the page tables where the uh, flags are kept. That's not very cache friendly. MGLIU iterates over the page tables linearly uh, with some cleverness to try to skip over uh, empty uh, or absent pages. Uh, it also uses a feedback loop called a PID controller, which I should not pretend to understand. 
uh, that should mitigate interaction. Uh, this is now enabled uh, by default on most Debian architectures. I think there are some first Debian architectures where it's not supported. There's currently a uh, runtime uh, switch that allows uh, switching back to the old algorithms. That will probably go away once MGLRU proves that it can do at least as well in almost all cases. Now, we have a new use for uh, the EVPF virtual machine. You can write drivers in it. Uh, the human interface device, or HID, is a standard class uh, that's supported on USB and Bluetooth and I think some other buses. Uh, and that's used for input devices such as keyboards and mice. Each device needs to provide a descriptor of its capabilities uh, and that allows them to be handled by a single generic driver uh, in principle. In practice, uh, some devices need special drivers to recognize their custom keys uh, or to work around bugs in the device descriptors when they didn't quite follow the HID standard. The generic driver now supports implementing those quirks and many other kinds of filtering with, a, with an EVPF program. This avoids the need to build and rebuild a custom driver for each kernel version. It should avoid uh, security bugs in descriptor parsing in those custom drivers. In the past, there have been bugs in HIT drivers that have been exploitable and actually exploited uh, using custom hardware. Currently, there's no infrastructure for collecting and distributing uh, HIT drivers implemented in this way. Uh, also, this option isn't enabled in Debian's kernels. Uh, it appears to currently require that the HIT generic driver is built in rather than as a module, uh, but I think that's probably fixable. Now, not, uh, not really a feature as such, but uh, a kind of interesting change. Uh, Rust uh, for the Linux kernel. Rust is a, uh, I was going to say new, but it's not so new anymore. It's a modern systems programming language that's designed to ensure memory safety, preventing the sort of bugs you often see in C programs, like use after free and data races. Many, possibly the majority of uh, security vulnerabilities in the Linux kernel involve that sort of bug. So using Rust in the kernel instead of C could improve security a lot. Uh, replacing existing C code with Rust, if it happens, will be a pretty long process. Currently, support for Rust in the kernel is considered experimental, so none of the core subsystems can make use of it. Also, there are quite a few uh, architectures supported by Linux that are not supported by Rust or the LLVM compiler uh, framework that it currently mostly relies on. There is some work to use GCC as a backend for, uh, for Rust, and that I think will enable support for, at least in principle, for all of the architectures in Linux. Minimal support for Rust code in the kernel landed in 6.1, more APIs have been added later. Rust code is mostly safe, as I said, uh, but when calling into C code, that's considered unsafe. Uh, and the idea is that you use the unsafe C APIs to build safe uh, Rust APIs. Uh, that other Rust code can uh, call into. And then you only need to worry about proving the safety of that adapter layer. Currently, actually no entry features are written in Rust. There are some samples, but nothing that you can uh, enable directly. There are several out of tree drivers. There's Asahi, which is a driver for the GPUs in Apple Silicon which other name suggests has been developed by the uh, Asahi Linux project. That's pretty interesting. There aren't, isn't any other driver for this hardware. There's RNVME, which is a rewrite of the existing NVME block driver. Uh, so far as I know, there haven't been any security 
bugs in the existing driver, but that's possibly interesting as a um, point of comparison because it's, uh, it's quite a high performance driver if you compare the uh, whether the Rust version is uh, faster or slower than the C version. And then you have a Rust, Rust binder, which is a rewrite of the binder uh, interprocess communication driver used in Android. That has had a number of security flaws, uh, security vulnerabilities in the past that probably would be impossible if it was written in Rust. And I think that is planned to be, or is actually used in, uh, in Android. Now, TLS in the kernel. TLS is uh, the transport layer security, what we used to call SSL. Back in the 80s, when we started doing network file systems and storage, trusting the lo local network might have been a uh, reasonable uh, thing to do. It's rather naive today. But uh, most network file systems and storage protocols are still unencrypted and often unauthenticated. That's now changing. NFS over TLS is now possible. Uh, starting with 6.4, you can enable it on the server, and 6.5 on the client. Uh, Linux supports NVMe over TCP, and there are some patches that have been proposed to add TLS to that that uh, missed 6.6, .6, but might uh, land in 6.7. Another protocol that uh, should get TLS is iSCSI, but I haven't seen any, pat any patches for that yet. SMB seems to have its own encryption and authentication such that TLS is not necessary, um, but I'm not sure of that. The handshake and certificate validation that are required to set up a TLS connection are somewhat complex and it's probably not a great idea to do those in the kernel, so they are delegated to user space. There's a daemon called TLSHD uh, that's packaged in the KTLS utils package. Uh, the certificate of validation in this uh, still needs work, I think. If you're curious, see the upstream bug tracker. Now the cache stat system call is uh, there's a new system call that lets you query whether a file or part of it is cached in RAM. You could already do that with the M in core system call. Uh, the cache stat is a bit different from that. Uh, firstly, it operates on a file descriptor instead of a region of memory, so it doesn't require that the file is already M mapped. In addition to exposing uh, the cached state, uh, it also exposes which, whether pages are dirty uh, or being written back to storage. Uh, and rather than per page flags, it provides summary statistics. Uh, this is expected to be useful for database engines, in particular PostgreSQL would want to know this when choosing whether to use an index. If the table is in is in RAM, but the index is not, then it might be faster to do a full table scan instead of using an index. Applications that explicitly prefetch data uh, using FFIs, uh, and in particular SQL light, uh, would use this to monitor how well that prefetching is working and to adjust how far ahead they prefetch. This would also allow for visibility of which files are accounting for uh, most memory usage in the terms of the page cache. I don't know if there's a specific tool uh, being written to do that. Uh, a documentation change is that uh, Netlink is getting better documentation. Uh, Netlink is a protocol used for configuring Linux networking. Uh, it's quite extensible where it's been used for uh, various different areas of networking and some other kernel substances. Documentation of the protocol hasn't been very good. 
Uh, the intention was that it was supposed to replace a bunch of uh, APIs based on IACTLs. In practice, application developers often found that those older APIs were easier to understand. And at times, kernel network developers have misunderstood how Netlink is supposed to work and introduced bugs in the implement implementation. And then uh, the result is those are part of the protocol because fixing those will break applications. But now the current source includes a Netlink handbook, which seems quite extensive, uh, that uh, explains to user space developers how to work with Netlink sockets. Uh, and there's some notes for kernel developers on using its internal APIs. The internal APIs are also somewhat documented with kernel talk in the relevant header. So those together with the notes, hopefully, uh, should be what's needed. Uh, there have also been some new security hardening uh, mechanisms added since last year. Uh, the kernel has for a long time had the option, uh, controlled with a syscall, to panic after a oops or warn event that uh, indicates a serious problem. Uh, if you enable panic mode and reboot or panic, then uh, the system should uh, cover uh, sort of problems automatically. Uh, but there are also certain kernel exploits that that tend to crash a lot uh, because they rely on uh, certain things that are randomized in the kernel. So uh, it's possible to set a limit, a limit other than one of the number of oops or one events that can occur uh, before the kernel panics. Now, if you set that and also panic or reboot, that uh, should mitigate against uh, an exploit of that type. There are some new options for control flow integrity. As a reminder, on most architectures, the kernel should not be mapping any memory as both writable and executable. That means if there's a kernel bug, it allows you the space to write to arbitrary memory. It's still going to check code into the kernel. Most architectures also uh, prevent the kernel from executing memory from addresses that are assigned to user space. As a result, in order to exploit arbitrary memory writes in the kernel, an attacker normally needs to redirect control flow by overwriting return addresses and or function pointers. This is called ROP, general-oriented programming, or JOP, jump-oriented programming. On R64, there are two mechanisms for mitigating return-oriented programming. Software shadow stacks or hardware pointer authentication codes. It's now possible to build a kernel with both of those enabled and have it choose at boot time which to use based on whether the CPU supports pointer authentication codes. On x86, there's a new mechanism for converting jump pointer programming called Fine IBT that combines the hardware feature of indirect branch tracking uh, and a software type check. Unfortunately, both of these software mitigations require use of the Clang compiler. This might be a reason to switch to building the kernel with Clang rather than GCC on these architectures. But it's always possible that GCC will add support for all these mitigations at some point. On IBM System Z, which we call S390X, we have the option to clear the kernel stack on exit from a system call. This is useful because some exploits rely on a system call that reads uninitialized data from the stack, and then they use uh, the previous system call to, to write some uh, specific data uh, into that space that's going to be read by the next system call. As ever, there have been CPU bugs that we've had to mitigate. These are all x86 uh, bugs. Uh, Firstly, straight line speculation. Some processors turn out to speculatively execute the instructions after an unconditional branch or return instruction, even though there's no way that that, uh, that would be the correct instruction to run next. 
As a mitigation for this, the kernel will tell the compiler to insert in three instructions, which are speculation barriers. It will do after red instructions and possibly after unconditional branches. Then there was rep bleed. Uh, this is actually two different vulnerabilities in internal AMD processes. But they both involve training uh, an indirect branch predictor uh, that will then be used for uh, predict predicting uh, the return addresses or return instruction. Two different mitigations for that uh, using the existing uh, in indirect branch restricted speculation feature on Intel and return thunks on AMD. This is where uh, instead of having return at the end of each function, you have a branch to a single return uh, instruction which is carefully set up to not be misdirected. Probably the most serious of these bugs is SendBleed, which was found in the MD Send2 core. Uh, this is where the processor wrongly predicts that a vector register will be cleared, then finds out it won't, uh, and ends up uh, with that register being freed and potentially reused. And the result is that data can leak between different contexts. This, unlike the other bugs listed here, is non-speculative. It creates uh, actual corruption of the architectural state of the register. There are several possible mitigations for this. There's the microcode fix. Uh, there's also a chicken bit uh, that can be used to disable some hardware feature that somehow avoids the bug. And worst case, it's possible to disable AVX, but that may cause some programs to crash. Uh, then there's an Intel specific issue, gather data sampling. This involves, uh, it also involves vector registers. In this case, it's possible for speculative uh, execution to use stale contents of vector registers. That uh, is also mitigated by a macro code fix or by disabling the AVX. Finally, another AMD issue, speculative return stack overflow. This is a bit complex. The uh, attacker can train the indirect branch predictor to the, uh, a whole lot of call instructions, and the speculative execution of those call instructions will uh, push addresses onto the return address stack. Subsequently, that causes the return address predictor to uh, mispredict the target of return instructions. Mitigation for this is also fairly complicated. Uh, it's different for different AMD models. Finally, packaging changes. We've been able to support for various different system on chips and platforms. On R64, there's the Orwin H6, Qualcomm SDA H45, the Renesis RZG2, L and M, and a bunch of different rock chip SOCs. RHF, uh, we belatedly enabled the NXP IMX7, and on RISC 564, we've enabled uh, SSCs from all winner, microchip, Renesas, and Star 5. We also enabled support for uh, various ARM core site hardware tracing facilities, many features of newer Intel CPUs, and the CXL expansion bus. We've made some changes to the ABI numbering, which is using the kernel release string and package names to distinguish packages that have different kernel module APIs. Experiment, experimental uploads now use a number of zero. Previously, they used a string RC and the release candidate number or trunk. Uh, Backports now use zero dot deb and then the debian release number dot and the original uh, ABI number. This is helpful to distinguish backports across multiple releases, which are possible now with extended LTS. The Linux cable packages now also incorporate the ABI number. We have some uh, ABI changes also involving compatible changes to the uh, build scripts. Uh, we've enabled a couple of hard new options there's the kernel electric fence, or K-fence, which can provide a partial mitigation for buffer overflows and use after free. It's less effective than the address sanitizer, 
but uh, had a lower performance cost. Uh, that uh, still needs to be turned on at boot time, it's difficult to off. On some architectures, we've enabled randomized current stack offsets. This mitigates the same kind of exploits that are, are mitigated by clearing the current stack, uh, but has a lower performance cost, so that's terminal by default. We've disabled the TIOC STI operation on uh, terminals. This is an ICTL that injects characters into the input part of the terminal. We have, when you have an unprivileged, unprivileged program showing the same terminal, terminal, it's possible for an unprivileged program to inject characters, uh, put itself into the background, and if the privileged program then comes into the foreground, it can take that input and maybe execute a command. Uh, so that's, that's no longer available uh, to unprivileged programs. It uh, does have legitimate use such as by DRL TTY, but that normally runs as, as root, and that will still work. I made quite a few fixes and improvements to the test patches script, uh, which we provide to allow users to um, build a patched kernel uh, and test a, a possible fix uh, on their own system. Where there's a bug uh, that's specific to uh, particular device that the reporter has and we, the kernel team, do not have. These changes make uh, all the packages installable uh, and co-installable. Uh, it changes the uh, ABI number so that these packages won't replace the uh, distribution provided packages. Uh, and the build should also go faster. We don't run it under fake route anymore and we don't uh, build debug information. On R64 and RMHF, we've enabled the sound and speak up uh, UDEP packages that can be used for speech synthesis in the installer, although I'm not sure those have been uh, actually probably integrated in the installer yet. So, type of questions. Can you not visible, please? Press V. I need to go to my laptop so I can... Can you not hear me? I hear you, uh, and I'm visible. No, you're not. Oh, well, but... Okay. Did you say... Don't say butts in public. Anyway, um... have a question, please stand up. We need a question. There we go. Okay, sorry, we'll get you a mic. I'm trying to... Uh... Yeah, just talk into that. Hello, Ben. Hello. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> Thanks for the lightning insights. I have few questions. My first question is regarding a new feature introduced in the Linux kernel 6, that is XFS online repair, and how it is coming, it means how we are going to use it what are the pros and cons we will have? The second question is regarding 
the swap memory management which was highlighted very much. So in the containerized environment we don't use the swap. So how is it is going to be managed? And the um, sorry. And just last shall question. I, shall I give you this one? Yes. Just that's just the last question. That's not Uh, yes, I still hear you. Okay. So, uh, should I repeat my questions? Yes. I have the questions all right. I don't know if anyone else did. Okay. So, my last question is regarding the NFS with the TLS support. So, already uh, I have been using NFS in multiple cluster environments. So, it has high load average problem when there is a high amount of read write operations. So, using with TLS shall deprecate the performance or what can impact it has? Thank you. Okay, so XFS uh, online, what is it, online checking. Uh, I've heard of this, I don't really know anything about it. Um, I would hope that uh, whoever is maintaining XFS procs will uh, um, uh, do whatever is needed there or talk to uh, the kernel team if we need to make some configuration changes. Uh, your second question was something about swap. Um, and I'm not quite sure what the quite sure what the question was. Um, and thirdly for the NFS performance over TLS, I haven't looked at that yet. All I did was um, I package KTLS utils, I worked out how to configure uh, running NFS over TLS uh, and made sure that it worked, but I didn't look at performance at all. In the uh, last slide we were talking about limiting configurable with CCD. So what we are actually trying to limit? Is it the user security limit, the end proc, hard limit, soft limit, or are we talking about the current CCTL parameters? Thank you. I'm sorry, I still didn't understand. I did not understand that question. Uh, do we repeat or do we defer for later? Yes, why don't you, why don't you email me the question later? Uh, anyone else for questions? Doesn't look like there's anything there, so we're actually going to finish ahead of schedule. Are you happy to? Right, um, with about two minutes to go, I guess that's the kind of talk. Enjoy the tea break. Um, there are sessions at six o'clock.